It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jun Ho Lee. So Jun Ho got his uh, bachelor in chemistry from Pohang University in South Korea. He then obtained a master of science also in chemistry from Caltech from the group of Professor Thomas F. Miller. And in 2019, if I'm not mis mistaken, he got his PhD from UC Berkeley in the group of uh, Professor Martin Head Gordon. And during his PhD, he also did an internship at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where he worked together with a collaborator of mine, Fionn Malone. So Jun Hu um, has, done, has worked on different topics, but what is particularly interesting for us also is quantum Monte Carlo of Fermi systems, which we are also very much working on. Um, furthermore, let me mention that Jun Hu has received um, a couple of awards for his outstanding works, including an ATS award in chemical physics for his uh, PhD dissertation. And today he's going to talk about challenges in quantum chemistry beyond the electronic ground state. So go ahead. Um, okay. Um, I would like to thank Tobias for inviting me to give a talk here and also everybody else um, here to come here to listen to this talk. Um, so I guess before I go on, I thought that I should really tell you a little bit about what are quantum chemistry problems, um, mainly because I'm a quantum chemist, I'm not a condensed matter physicist. So what are really quantum chemistry problems that I would like to solve and I do care in, in my most of the career. Um, so we largely spend most of our time on molecular applications. So one class of examples that I really enjoyed um, working on is organic bioradicaloids. Um, it's made of carbon, hydrogen, you know, oxygen and nitrogen, and they are very boring looking compounds. Um, but what's actually interesting and surprising about them is that they carry unpaired electrons and still um, these molecules are stable at ambient conditions and pressure. Um, so these unpaired electrons, they, they are antiferromagnetically coupled, so they form open shell, but they are singlet. So it's open shell singlet, but stable. So whether a given molecule is a biradicaloid or even they are stable biradicaloid, these are the questions that quantum chemistry um, methods can answer. So I studied quite a bit of them before. Another class of example is um, becoming quite relevant for um, quantum information science nowadays because single molecular magnets can be used to build quantum computers, um, specifically qubits that go into quantum computers. So this one um, gets, um, it's got nine chromium atoms and each chromium atom has three unpaired electrons um, and overall, um, the ground state of this complex is um, S equals three half. So most of the electrons that are um, um, si um, lo localized at chromium atom, they are antiferromagnetically coupled all the way down to um, three halves um, spin sector. So this is a prototypical strong correlation problem that goes way beyond um, the reach of the traditional um, approach to um, exact diagonalization, for instance. And, and we do develop methods um, for treating these difficult systems and figuring out the ground state spin sector. That's precisely what quantum chemistry can answer in these um, applications. Another application um, that I, I got extremely interested in um, in recent years is plasmonic catalysis. So what is plasmonic catalysis? Well, I have a gold nanoparticle. This is a surface, it's a solid state um, system. And I have a small molecule H2 um, vibrating near this metal surface and it comes, um, comes in and it gets absorbed in uh, on the um, gold nanoparticle surface. And once it's absorbed, um, then we shine the light, create hot electrons at the surface and these hot electrons hop onto H2. Um, and then it gets, um, it promotes the vibrational excitation. And in the end, H2 um, gets dissociated beautifully. Um, so this nanoparticle surface acts as a um, catalyst for this um, reaction we are looking at. And, and it is a catalyst only upon um, the, um, when we shine the light. So that's why it's called plasmonic catalysis. They are challenging and therefore interesting to me um, because um, it includes bone breaking. This is a um, classic example of strong correlation in quantum chemistry. 
and they involve vibrations near metal surface. Like I said, these H2, it's a molecule, so they have to vibrate. And when they vibrate near metal surface, um, it invokes some non-adiabatic effects um, in the underlying dynamics. So boron oppenheim approximation is meant to fail. And it obviously involves a finite temperature. It's a metallic system. And then um, hot electrons do matter um, in making this reaction happen. So finite temperature do matter here. And it involves light matter interaction because we have to shine the light to promote this, um, create these hot electrons. And these play a crucial role in the underlying reaction. Um, so all these four are really summarizing the state of the art um, challenges in quantum chemistry. And I really like um, um, that this single, one single um, category of reaction actually includes all these four challenges. So typical quantum chemistry approaches to um, this class of um, problem um, is really um, very limited. Um, it's mainly because electronic Schrodinger's equation is always solved. It's non-relativistic and also born Oppenheimer approximation. So my electronic Hamiltonian is actually pretty complicated than um, most of the lattice model Hamiltonian. It's fully dense. I don't really assume any, any zero terms in the Hamiltonian. So I have full one body term and two body term here. And we are interested in an eigenstate of um, um, this electronic Hamiltonian. So note that there is no notion of nuclei in this Hamiltonian. One usually focuses on the ground state, at least in quantum chemistry, um, but how about nuclei, finite temperature effects and excited states? None of these are really a part of ground state problem of the electronic Hamiltonian. Um, so these are the topics that I would like to focus on um, um, later in this talk. So let's focus on the nuclei bit first. So nuclei can matter in reality. And like I said, um, within the boron oppenheimer approximation, they don't really enter the Hamiltonian term directly. They only influence um, these matrix elements of electronic Hamiltonian in an indirect way um, because they behave like a, a fixed point charges, uh, not real quantum particles. But nuclear degrees of freedom, um, they really manifest through vibrations coupled to electrons. So um, again, the relevant context is if I have a um, vibrating molecule near metal surface, um, that's where um, these vibrational modes strongly couple um, to um, electrons on the metal surface. And they determine properties of a lot of materials, actually carrier mobility, band gap renormalization, and temperature dependence of the band gap. All these are, um, you would get them wrong if you don't account for nuclei coupled to electrons in this system. So one class of material is um, perovskite, lead halide perovskite. Um, it's got a, um, I guess we characterize it to have weak um, electron vibration coupling but it's, it's strong enough that usual perturbation treatment would fail. Um, so this is one class of materials you can, um, you must worry about electron vibration coupling other than molecules near metal surface. Um, another example is pentacin crystal. Um, um, I've got individual pentacin um, far apart from each other, but electrons or carriers um, are localized at each pentacin site. Um, and even there, there is a vibration and electronic um, coupling um, that we cannot really ignore to compute the properties, um, transport properties correctly. And I, as a quantum chemist, I would really like to study them fully ab initio way and making no approximation. Um, but at the moment, we are really limited in computational power. So we ended up actually spending a lot of time in studying the Hubbard Holstein model. And I will go through what this model actually means in a minute. Um, but just to make sense of why are we even um, um, making this huge jump from, say, pentacin crystal to Hubbard Holstein model, well, individual pentacin molecule can be approximated as a site in the Hubbard Holstein model. And it can up to um, it can host up to two electrons um, per pentacin molecule. And each, mo each pair of molecule at one side has on-site repulsion characterized by U. And from one pentacin molecule to another side, it can hop through this minus T hopping parameter here. Um, and then there is a 
coupling between vibrational mode of this pentacin molecule and the electron um, uh, occupying this pentacin molecule. So that strength of vibration electron coupling is characterized by this minus G. And each vibrational mode is characterized by a single vibrational uh, frequency omega here, which is just harmonic oscillator term here. Um, so that's how we actually can make sense of making this huge jump. Um, so to take a um, deeper look into this model, it's a prototypical vibronic Hamiltonian. So electrons are actually linearly coupled to vibrations. So I'm going to give you a proper functional form from that. And, and in this model, depending on the regimes, I can actually tune the strengths of non-adiabaticity and the quantum mechanical behavior of vibrations too. So if omega is very large, meaning um, vibrational is very fast, and in that case, um, um, vibrations behave um, very quantum mechanically. I mean, the same goes for non-adiabaticity. I can tune the ratio between G and omega um, in a way that I cannot treat electron vibration coupling term per perturbatively anymore. Um, so electronic Hamiltonian um, has a hopping term, one body term and two body term, um, and which are very sim very much simpler than the ab initio Hamiltonians that I described earlier. And vibrational term has harmonic oscillator term um, for each side. So each side, one vibrational mode with vibrational frequency omega um, has harmonic oscillator term. Note that I left out the um, zero point energy term because it's a constant term. I can just um, remove from the Hamiltonian uh, without loss of generality. And the coupling term, like I said, it's a linear coupling, linear in the sense that um, this electronic density operator is coupled to only linearly to um, vibrational um, creation and annihilation operators at each side. And the strength is, like I said, it's uh, proportional to minus G. And this really fully de defines the Hubbard-Holstein model. There are um, two interesting phases for the ground state. Um, there are actually more phases than these two that I will describe today, um, but these two are um, what's relevant for the purpose of this talk. Um, so the first example, um, the first phase is spin density wave. Um, so spin density wave arises when among these um, Hamiltonian terms, when this Hubbard U term um, is the largest. So if it's the largest parameter in this model, then electrons would like to avoid um, having to pay the penalty of occupying the same side. So they naturally occupy only one side. Um, each electron occupies only one side and they never doubly occupy any side because they have to avoid the penalty coming from you. And it has spin up and spin down alternating pa um, pattern and thereby um, it is really anti-ferromagnetic phase and it is spin density wave um, as a phase. And there is a charge density wave. Um, what it does is um, it happens when effective U, um, I can actually apply some unitary transformation of the whole Hamiltonian called Langfordshop transformation um, without actually changing any underlying physics of the Hamiltonian, it's a unitary transformation. And then I can back out some effective um, Hubbard U strength so this U term gets reduced by 2G squares over omega um, once, once I perform that unitary transformation. And, and what happens um, in the phase diagram is that for a suitable G and omega value, the sign of U effective gets flipped. And when it gets flipped, when it becomes negative, electrons tend to conden um, condense into one side. So um, it, it would like to, they would like to doubly occupy one side. And since they doubly occupy some sides, they have to leave some sites empty. And even then, um, because of this energy lowering from negative U effective, um, it produces the lower energy um, compared to spin density wave. Um, so, um, and then it gets actually lattice distortion through um, this um, G term, meaning that um, vibrational displacement at each side, these are harmonic oscillators, so they can have a shifted center at each side. And, and that's why I shifted these sides um, up, um, down and up um, this way because they get distorted. 
And the same lattice distortion doesn't happen in spin density wave. So it's a feature of charge density wave in this model. So these two are phases that matter, um, at least for the purpose of this talk. And as you can see, there is a need for an approach that works for all regimes of U, omega, and G. Um, we, we must get both phases correctly, and we need a single method that can handle both phases um, without losing any accuracy or generality. But don't we have really enough for electrons? Well, I get this question a lot, when, especially when I give talks to um, audience outside quantum chemistry, because they often feel really overwhelmed by too many methods in um, electronic structure theory. And it, it is certainly true. So, um, so we have um, um, cubic scaling mean field approach, Hartree-Fock and density functional theory and simple perturbation theory, MP2. It's more expensive than that. Um, and then there are some diagrammatic techniques um, under the name of couple cluster theory, n to the six and n to the seven. And in the end, we have brute force approaches, GMRG and FCIQMC they are becoming increasingly accurate. And at the same time, in the end, um, their costs become exponentially expensive. So what this plot actually doesn't really tell us is the applicable system size. So um, if I were to do a um, mean field approach, I would then um, be able to treat a um, large system like props guys um, that I described earlier. Um, but if I insist on high accuracy, um, and an exponentially expensive method, then I can probably treat oxygen molecule or one or two um, and very tiny chemical system. Um, so there is a huge discrepancy between system size and um, cost, and, 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 but at the same time, accuracy and cost as well. And the method that I would, uh, I like most, um, at least these days, is um, sort of an outlier in this plot. So in terms of the accuracy, um, it is actually um, somewhere in between these diagrammatic methods, CCST and CCST parent SST, its cost is asymptotically only n to the fifth. Um, so it's on par with um, MP2, simple perturbation theory, but we get um, more than just simple perturbation theory in terms of accuracy. But it's a QMC um, method, so there is a huge prefactor associated with this. So system size is still a um, um, little, um, little better than CCSD, um, although the asymptotic cost is n to the fifth, but practically we cannot really treat um, so much larger um, system than CCSD, so I put A of QMC here. So extending these methods, so these are all electronic structure methods. Um, these methods to vibronic problems has become become very um, popular in the, in the field somehow. So um, I listed some research groups who attempt to generalize these methods on, on these curves. Um, but today I'm gonna focus on generalizing these outliers um, created by AFQMC to Viveronic problems. I guess before we go on with AFQMC, I should really tell you a little bit about imaginary time evolution um, to compute the ground state. Um, so imaginary time evolution can, in principle, exactly compute the ground state. And what it does is, well, let's write the ground state wave function psi naught um, as a, um, some initial wave function phi naught, which has a finite overlap with psi naught. And then we're going to apply this imaginary time propagator e to the minus tau h um, until tau becomes infinity. So this is, this is how imaginary time uh, propagation computes the targets, the ground state. And the way, so why does it actually work? Well, it's actually um, quite straightforward to see if you actually expand this psi, uh, sorry, phi naught um, in terms of the exact eigenstate. So psi naught, psi one, they are exact eigenstate and psi naught is the ground state, psi one is the first excited state. And once we do that and pull out the common prefactor, um, then I can see um, the leading leading term in this expansion is psi naught. Um, and this is zigzag and no approximation is involved and it converges to the exact ground state exponentially in imaginary time tau um, because the other um, excited wave functions have a prefactor that is proportional to e to the minus tau times um, excitation energy. So um, as long as there is a finite excitation energy, um, these coefficients should decay to zero. 
exponentially in imaginary time tau. But of course, if, if we make no approximation, this should scale exponentially with system size. And the main reason is um, for this naive application of this approach, um, psi node and this imaginary time propagator, their dimension scales exponentially with system size. So simply doing matrix vector product is already exponentially expensive. Um, so let's make some approximations. I will tell you my favorite approximation, namely um, auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo or AFQMC. So um, in a nutshell, well, we do, we do the same imaginary time evolution, um, but here I guess one tweak we did is that um, electronic wave function. So we, we do need Byronic wave function um, um, to, to imaginary propagation. Uh, propagate in imaginary time because uh, the ground state we're looking for is vibronic ground state, not just electronic ground state. So I take this um, entire Hubbard Holstein um, model Hamiltonian and exponentiate to form the propagator. Um, but then on the initial wave function side, I do need a vibronic state and I simplified it in a way that it is a simple product between electronic wave function and um, vibrational displacement. So I treat vibrations in the first quantization and it is much more convenient to work with, especially when we do QMC. And we make the same assumption. So initial wave function should have some overlap um, with the true exact um, vibronic ground state. And then I discretize time. So um, I have an infinitesimal time step propagator and I apply it over and over again um, to this initial state um, to realize this imaginary time propagation. The name auxiliary field comes in uh, when we actually decompose this prop many body propagator um, as, a, as an integral over um, some fields and the integrand is one body propagator, this B matrix. So X is auxiliary fields. And for a given X, we form this um, one body propagator B um, that can be readily applied to this um, initial wave function without invoking any exponential scaling. So auxiliary field sampling is really crucial to make these matrices and vectors um, ex, you know, um, manageable on a classical computer to deal with. Um, so they are now um, scaled linearly with system size, um, namely the dimension of these matrices scale linearly with the system size, not exponentially. So then in the end, the final imaginary time evolution form we do is we have a bunch of these propagator um, sampled through these auxiliary fields and I apply them over and over again to propagate in imaginary time. And of course, this is a extremely high dimensional integral to do. So we resort to um, quantum Monte Carlo to sample these fields. And to use quantum Monte Carlo, we write down global vibronic state, um, psi of tau at the measure time tau as a linear combination of a Walker wave function. Um, so um, this, this summation over I is some summation over Walker. So individual Walker has a weight and I'm doing some important sampling through psi t and I will get back to this um, psi t, the importance of this psi t later um, in the talk. Um, and this um, numerator represents the Walker wave function. So for instance, if I have three um, walkers, um, they would sample um, different sets of auxiliary fields um, and they have different um, sets of wave function, um, you know, namely the tensor product between electronic degrees of freedom and, and vibrational degrees of freedom. And I have many, many walkers to represent the global vibrony wave function and each Walker wave function is being propagated through this B operator here in, in measuring time. But of course, if we do this naively, um, then we run into the sign problem because of the electronic degrees of freedom. And there is a, there is a constraint we put on the imaginary time propagation in a way that we can remove those Walkers um, that violate certain constraints um, that are based on an uh, a priori set um, psi trial wave function. And, and the details of the constraint is really explained in, in, in our recent paper. And I won't um, really go into too much details of the constraint, but there is a protocol to really kill these 
walkers that violate the constraint we set um, a priori. Um, so that's the only thing you need to really know about AFQMC, I hope. Um, so the simplest try away function um, that we will use is actually very critical to understand because the choice of the trial wave function is um, very important to achieve high accuracy. Like I said, it, in, it sets the walker death condition and we sets them in a way that we do not really know um, how they would actually work a priori. Um, and of course, if we improve the trial wave function and make the walker death condition more and more accurate, eventually we'll converge to the exact answer. Um, but this is the source of the bias in AFQMC that we introduced, so therefore we must really choose them very wisely. Um, excuse me, do you, do you allow an intermediate question? I think Attila uh, raised his hand. Okay. I had a quick question, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but on the previous slide, just I think in the, um, I just wanted to understand if you can explain briefly, how is your, the, the B operator? connected to the Hamiltonian. I'm, it's maybe a bit detailed, but if you could explain it briefly, that would be nice uh, to make the connection to the Hamiltonian. I see. Um, so the, you know, B is really uh, reformulating e to the minus delta tau h, um, not the Hamiltonian itself. And it is actually done through what's called the Hubbard Stranovich transformation. And, you know, the Hamiltonian is the two body term, right? Um, so the two body term can be organized in a way that it is written as a sum over squared operators. So I have some one body operators and I just square that. Um, so it's got a bunch of squared operators for the two body term. And it's squared, so it's like e to the minus um, alpha x squared, um, like a Gaussian integral. So these squared operators can be then decoupled through Gaussian transformation um, through just one body term. Um, so because it's one body square, so I can do the Gaussian transformation to write that as a um, field integral um, times um, exponential minus delta tau x, where x is the field and that one body operator. So the two body terms get completely removed um, because of this hubbard stranodovich transformation or simply Gaussian integral. So we are merely doing um, you know, if you do Gaussian integral, you get Gaussian function out. So we are just doing the inverse Gaussian integral transform to write that um, e to the minus delta tau, um, some one body operator squared as an integral over one body operators. So that's, that's the, I guess I should have really brought some equations to explain this better, but does, does this make sense to you? Yeah, thank you. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, that, that explains it, thanks. Um, so let's see. So, um, so making trials too complicated um, is, of course, um, would result into much steeper scaling. And in the worst case, it would make the algorithm scale exponentially again. So the simplest one we pick to do um, is the one that allows for efficient implementation. And it's, it is as follows. It's very simple. So for spin density wave, we know that spin unrestricted Hartree Fock can describe this spin density wave for the electronic degrees of freedom. And then um, for the vibration part, um, we consider only coherent state, namely the shifted harmonic oscillator wave function for each side. And we really consider just a simple product state between these two for the trial wave function. The same, um, the similar happens for the charge density wave where to describe the charge density wave, we do need spin restricted Hartree Fock state. And then we keep the vibrational state um, just the same. So shifted harmonic oscillator state. We determine all the variational parameters go into these trial wave functions variationally. So, um, so there is an efficient way to determine these wave functions um, in the beginning. And of course the point I would like to emphasize is that it's really a simple product wave function between a mean field state and a shifted harmonic oscillator state. And it actually worries a lot of people when I say this because there is a no entanglement between electrons and vibrations. So this trial wave function would be qualitatively wrong um, when entanglement between electrons and vibrations um, is, is large. And, but it is exact in the limit of infinite U um, because spin density wave um, 
is really um, exact in that limit. Um, so there is no mixture of phases or, or it, is, it will be exactly just the same as um, this individual spins pinned at its side. And that's, that's what this UHF state can de describe exactly. And it is also um, exact in the limit of infinite G um, and it is uh, the, the system exhibits um, charge density wave completely and RHF can describe that um, charge density wave for the electronic part and this coherent state can describe the lattice distortion exactly in that limit. So these are very nice limits. Um, but, you know, like I said, having no entanglement is a little concerning, but of course the bivaroni correlation is then built by AFQMC. We're not really um, finishing up our calculation here. Instead, we're uh, applying the propagator to this state um, um, with the constraints pro provided by this trial wave function. Um, so once we imaginary time propagate, um, then we would build um, bivaroni correlation properly through AFQMC. So let's look at some benchmark study. And I would note, uh, have to note that there is um, important dimensionless bivaroni coupling, which goes like G square over omega square, um, which we will use um, later in the talk. So it characterizes how, um, how much larger G is compared to um, vibrational frequency omega essentially. So not just G alone, it measures how uh, much G is larger uh, than, oh, sorry, there should be actually no square here. So it should be G square over omega. So, um, so it measures the ratio between G square and omega. And if you remember it, G square over omega is um, where the effective Hubbard um, U parameter um, gets in, right? So it's U minus G square over two omega um, T. Um, that's the effective U parameter we discussed before. So this is the dimensionless fibronic coupling that is relevant in this study. Um, so we'll study U equals four and DMRG, which is a second quantized approach for the vibrational part uh, will be used as an unbiased approach for 1D and AFGMC um, with the trial wave function I just explained, simple product state um, um, will be presented and large omega is difficult for us. Um, um, it is. It has something to do with this. Um, um, when omega is the largest, we cannot actually, um, even though G can be much larger than T, we cannot really treat this G term as fully perturbatively. So um, it is, this is actually increasing um, the correlation between electron and vibration by actually increasing omega, not, not actually G itself. So we need omega to be kept to be the largest and G can be larger than T and that's the most difficult regime for us, but it's easy for DMRG because second quantized methods actually have um, um, very little overhead on treating um, large omega values. Large lambda is easy for us um, because when lambda is the largest, so G square omega is the largest, um, well, very, very large or infinity, then G is infinity and our trial wave function is exact in that limit. But it, it's difficult for second quantized methods because they have to consider many, many phonon um, excitations. And TD is inherently difficult for DMRG. So let's have a look at the benchmark results. So for 1D, um, I'm scanning over um, this dimensionless fibroni coupling. Um, there is, um, Lambda equals one point, which we will get back to it momentarily. But the point here really is um, that I couldn't really run DMRG uh, for larger lambda values, because as I said, uh, it would require large phonon excitations, which goes um, beyond um, the computational resources that I had. And AFGMC follows very closely DMRG results when it's available in all coupling strengths. Uh, and it undergoes um, spin density wave to charge density wave transition at uh, lambda equals one. This is where the effective um, Hubbard U parameter flips the sign. So we expect this to happen and, and AFGMC captures it. Uh, if I plot the energy difference between AFGMC and DMRG um, up to lambda equals one, I get certain, um, some bias um, because of the fermionic sign problem we have to control. Um, so this is constrained bias we have, and um, this is not really um, large for the physics we want to 
um, study, um, but it is a finite bias we, we have to be careful about. Um, but greater than lambda equals one, um, we really have nearly no bias at all for charge density wave. So this is pretty interesting that we only get biases for the spin density wave part. Doped systems are difficult for other QMC methods um, um, because of the sign problem. So we produce some benchmark numbers um, and also we obtain um, lambda equals 0 0.5 um, um, to be the phase transition point. And that is where um, the U effective value flips the sign again. So we predict the qualitative um, phase transition properly. So it's very good. But where does AFQMC actually struggle? So it certainly struggles. So it turned out that AFQMC struggles for the um, anti-adiabatic regime when omega is the largest parameter. Um, and this has nothing to do with electron-electron correlation. Um, this is due to the lack of vibronic entanglement in our simplest trial wave function. So let's actually um, give you some sense for how it fails. So I'm going to set u to be zero. So there is not even electronic interaction. So this is a sign problem free Hamiltonian, namely the Holstein model, and it's 2D, um, four by four lattice with half filling, um, so namely 16 electrons in the system. So I will look at two different dimensionless vibronic coupling, lambda equals 0 0.1 and lambda equals 0 0.3. Exact values obtained from the MRG, we can do um, um, large enough omega value, but not too small omega, but that's fine. Um, so perturbation theory, very simple second order perturbation theory um, um, actually works quite well, um, but then it deviates increasingly more um, from the exact answer as we increase omega value while keeping lambda fixed. So certainly um, higher frequencies are more difficult for our trial wave function because this perturbation theory is built on top of our trial wave function. And AFQMC seems all right um, if you look at look at them at this energy scale. Um, but if I zoom in and I can actually clearly see the increase in the bias compared to the exact answer as I increase the omega value. And this is really due to the lack of vibronic entanglement in our simplest trial wave function, um, which is actually used in the important sampling. So our important sampling um, is producing ergodicity issue or sampling issue that makes this sign problem free Monte Carlo calculation actually biased. Um, so I, I actually, I guess I, how much time do I have more? I guess I would like to go through the finite temperature a bit, but I don't well, feel know free to, Yeah, feel free to take another 20 minutes, I would say. That would still okay. give us like 30 minutes for discussion. Okay. Um, so let's um, let's see some finite temperature applications too. So as I said, plasmonic catalysis certainly has the component in the finite temperature aspect as well. Um, and in that example, right? So as we saw before, um, some chemical reactions can only happen at high temperature. So we need to create these hot electrons, and only then um, this molecule will dissociate. And as you all know very well, um, there are reactions that happen under extreme conditions, high temperature and pressure, certainly relevant for planetary um, systems. So um, the canonical model at um, T greater than zero um, is, is actually something that doesn't actually have nuclei at all. And, and it's because talking about finite temperature effect without nuclei, at least to me, it doesn't really make sense um, that much. So um, Let's actually get rid of nuclei for now and simulate what's left at T greater than zero. And this, this is um, a canonical example, uniform electron gas um, model at finite temperature. Tobias studied this uh, for very many, many years. He's, got, uh, he's written a nice review paper um, and I stole a figure, very nice figure from his review paper. Um, um, this one here, um, this is the applicability plot of state of the art methods. And I'm probably missing one or two more methods um, after, um, since 2017. There have been more efforts in this area. So, um, so this, is, this is a bit old, but um, it delivers the proper message that I would like to emphasize. So there is um, the x-axis is beginner size radius. So it's going from higher density to lower density. 
uh, and y axis is the temperature. So this is the applicability plot. So, um, so for instance, if I look at DMQMC line here, DMQMC can reliably run um, regimes here uh, where these arrows indicate. And the same goes for all other methods. Uh, what is um, interesting is perhaps that these all these methods are actually um, mainly unbiased QMC methods. So they produce exact results in the end if you can um, manage to run them. Complete basis set limit and thermodynamic limits, these are required to actually even um, compare with these methods. So just to be able to be on this plot already means that these methods could actually run up to the complete basis set limit and thermodynamic limits reliably as well. You know, the goal for a while was to generate exact exchange correlation functionals for density functional theory. And that's why um, a lot of research effort um, has been spent on this area, I, in my opinion. Um, and, and the empty region of this method um, here, you probably noted um, already, um, is really due to the fermionic sign problem. And these are um, unbiased QMC approaches. So unfortunately, this, this empty region um, is really still relevant for um, um, experiments, ex experimental warm dense matters. So um, we do want to have a method that can treat this empty region as well. So let's see um, if um, bias QMC approach, namely AF QMC can actually make some progress in that applicability plot. So this is now a, a finite temperature, not, not the ground state algorithm, so it's a bit um, different, but um, um, but it is pretty much the same in the sense that it can efficiently run in all regimes, but results can be often very biased. So we have to be very careful on how we put these constraints to kill the walker, uh, walkers that we don't want. Um, so in a nutshell, this is a finite temperature algorithm. So we start from the grand um, canonical partition function, and then we split this temperature beta into multiple delta tau slices, imaginary time slices. And we do make the same hubbard stranodovich transformation as before to write this many body imaginary time propagator into a um, integration of um, um, one body propagators um, as before. And, and then the grand partition function um, is then just sum over these auxiliary fields. So they are fields sample for each time slice. So this capital X um, denotes um, this little x auxiliary field for each time slice. So I'm summing over all um, of the auxiliary fields from um, each time slice. There is a neat trick that we can write this um, trace over um, pro product of the operators into determinant of a simple matrix uh, whose dimension scales linearly with the system size. So, um, so that's the final form we, we use in the computational um, algorithm in the end. So individual walkers will then sample a set of um, large X, so auxiliary fields for all these time slices, and, and I form this A matrix, and, and that's what um, contributes to this um, grand partition function. And of course, we sample observables directly um, with important sampling. Um, and if we do it naively, we run into the sign problem, as I alluded before, and Xi Wei Zhang had a nice paper in 1999, very long time ago, um, um, documenting how to set this Walker depth condition properly based on the trial wave function again. So very much um, similar to um, the Hubbard Holstein model we just talked about before. So I will show you that AFQMC can be useful. So even with biases, AFQMC can be actually often accurate. I know this for sure from chemical systems I looked at and Hubbard Holstein model we just discussed. Um, so is it accurate for the UEG model? Um, so I will look at um, half the Fermi de temperature. So theta equals 0 0.5 and below that uh, where um, no unbiased QMC data is present um, um, right now. Um, so, and then x axis is just varying the elect, um, beginner size radius or electronic density. So, we did have on, well, Tobias and Fionn Malone had, um, and others made a very accurate fit um, made based on um, data points 
in easier regimes, easier than these regimes, um, and also some formal um, constraints that we knew from zero temperature um, um, theory. So we did have some accurate fit, um, but it was never verified in these regimes because there was no data which could verify it um, before. And constraint um, path um, integral Monte Carlo CPIMC data point, um, and there is only one data point available. Larger RS value is um, difficult for a CPIMC to run um, because of the sign problem. And there is a bias QMC approach um, and similar in spirit to AFQMC in the sense that they also introduced some constraint to kill some certain walkers and restricted path integral Monte Carlo um, behaves very, very suspiciously. And especially um, when RS is small, um, it behaves very um, erratically. So this was actually been um, observed many, many times by several people and, and in these difficult regimes are no exception. Um, they deviate a lot from the fit and we do have to actually verify the fit in some way. So we ran AFQMC um, up to RS equals two and we get a beautiful match um, compared to the fit up to R equals, RS equals two uh, for both temperatures. And this is really the, uh, as far as I can tell, for the first time to verify this fits in the thermodynamic limit and basis limit. Um, and yet, and of course with the bias as well, but, but this is a beautiful agreement um, even, um, even with the bias. So this really um, speaks that um, um, bias that AFQMC has in these parameter regimes must be very small. Um, so this is really, um, a nice result that we ob observed in, in, the, in the paper we recently had. Um, so in the applicability plot, I, I can, I can uh, with, with enough confidence, I can say that um, EFQMC can actually treat <clears throat> RS equals two and below reliably and temperature, um, uh, we can go all the way down to 0 0.125, but we actually didn't present the data here. Um, so we can really successfully treat all these regimes um, without invoking exponential scaling. So everything should be um, still um, into the fifth. And there is still some room left, namely above RS equals two. Uh, we still don't have any methods that can um, reliably run, of course, below half the Fermi temperature. So that's the room left. Um, and I guess I should probably just skip spectral functions. Um, I guess so, yeah, we, I want to sort of end this timely so that it doesn't go uh, way beyond an hour. So let me just skip these slides um, and conclude. Um, so I hope that I was able to convince you that there are many interesting problems beyond the electronic ground state. I don't know if any of you are actually quantum chemists, but quantum chemistry has traditionally spent a lot of time on the ground state. Um, but I think these days people got, <clears throat> excuse me, people got really excited about other um, aspects of quantum chemistry, finite temperature and vibronic problems as well. So there are many interesting problems along these lines. And I showed you that with the simplest vibronic trial wave function, we can treat all parameter regimes except the vibrational frequency becomes the largest parameter in the model. And this was due to the lack of um, um, entanglement in the trial wave function we use. And better trial wave functions can be of course used um, and some simple gesture factors can be used um, without increasing the computational cost so much. So we are actually working on this. And we showed that the finite temperature AFQMC algorithm works well for all temperatures um, up to RS equals two uh, for the uniform electron gas model. Um, so low enough temperatures, we, we went down to 0 0.25 and in the paper, we went down to 0 0.125. Um, so we, we do have a method that works reliably um, below RS equals two. And I guess for vibronic problems, given what we already have, we must look into the finite temperature extension of the method, which is necessary um, to talk about temperature dependent transport properties um, later in the future. 
and I skipped the um, um, spectra function application. But anyway, so most most data presented here is generated by Poxy. It's a Python, um, com one hundred percent written in Python. Um, AFKMC uh, program. It's actually surprising in the sense that um, this is not at all a production level code, um, but we were able to run um, the uniform electron gas calculation, for instance, to the basis cell limit and thermodynamic limit. It was painful, but it was doable with, with a simple Python code. So if you guys are interested, um, you can take a look at the code there. Uh, with that, I would like to thank my advisor, uh, Dave Reichman, for teaching me interesting problems and really where to find them. And my other collaborators for EFQMC, Miguel and Dion. Um, Miguel is actually moving to Flat Aryan Institute. I'm joining Shi Wei Zhang, uh, who is also my collaborator. So, um, um, so Flat Aryan will now have pretty much everybody um, in EFQMC um, working there. So. Um, um, so I would like to thank my collaborators too. Um, and I would like to thank you for your attention too. And I would be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk. And I'm sure there will be many questions.